Hey there everyone, I'm meteorologist Adam Claybon. It's that time of the year again to talk about the forecast for the upcoming winter season. Now, you probably heard us use these words or this word quite often here the past few years, La Nina, right? Well, this year it's going to be all about El Nino, completely different story. First, your attention to what's happening across the globe right here. The blues indicate where those water temperatures are cooler than normal. The yellows, the oranges indicate where those water temperatures are warmer than normal. And when we're considering whether a year is going to be El Nino or La Nina, we look right here closer to the Pacific and it looks like we're seeing warmer than normal temperatures currently into those parts. With that being the case, and now that we're starting to see those numbers exceed that 0.5 degrees Celsius threshold, we're now in El Nino conditions. Something we're going to talk about more here, but the Pacific Northwest, when it comes to an El Nino year, usually during the winter, we see warmer than normal conditions and drier than normal conditions. And just to recap, past few years, La Nina, that's been giving us more of a highly amplified jet stream, more ridging, more dips in the jet stream, more of a pattern that produces high latitude blocking, as well as just a pattern that kind of sticks around for weeks, probably on times. Well, with the El Nino year, you get less of an amplified jet stream. Those systems are able to freely move here across the atmosphere in the subtropical jet stream starts to really get ramped up. So that means the southern part of the country, they get more of the systems. That's where a lot more of the moisture will go. And for us up here across the Pacific Northwest, we're not able to tap into some of that subtropical moisture to bring us as much moisture or precipitation that we usually typically see. It's not able to transport that as easily. Now, with a lot more of those systems and a lot more of a zonal pattern coming off of the ocean, typically means that we get that air mass off of the water, which is going to be warmer than what we should typically see coming off of the landmass here from Canada or anywhere else here farther to the north. It just kind of gives you an idea of what we're expecting. Now, you did see just off of the, the ocean there that we saw warmer than normal conditions for some of those bodies of water. Warm water usually likes to evaporate a little more easily. So recently, drought monitor has been improving for us with some of the systems moving on through, and we're completely drought free across areas of the Kitsap Peninsula and around the areas of, uh, in the immediate Puget Sound area. Where we could still use some work though is up across more of the Cascades, where we could definitely pack on some of the snow. Severe extreme drought in some of those spots as well as out there closer to the coast. So that's something we're going to talk about here coming up in a second. I just wanted to first go over again our El Nino conditions. We're right now in moderate El Nino territory, meaning that our temperatures down there near the equatorial Pacific have now exceeded the normals by about one degree Celsius. And there are indications, really good indications, that we're going to see an 80% chance of that becoming a strong El Nino or exceeding that by 1.5 degrees Celsius. And it's pretty much a given now that we're going to keep that around for the entire winter. And I did want to stress this right here. Even though we are seeing El Nino conditions, it does favor, but it does not guarantee that we would see a warmer than normal winter or a less rainy or a less snowy winter for the upcoming year. So first, let's talk about the snowfall. We were talking about the snow that we need across parts of the Cascades to kind of really uh, get that situated. So as we head on into the upcoming summer season, we don't have to worry about fire season as much. Something that might help us out, at least initially here, the Eurasian snow extent across the continent there. You can see the red line. That's where we are this year. All the other years for the past 18 years, we're kind of sitting in the middle to just above that. And over Eurasia, especially Siberia, that colder air really looks to get settled in and it builds and eventually it makes its way across the poles and into our part of the world too, where here in North America, we like to see more of that snow extent on the ground as well. Because once we start to see that cold air working its way towards us, we would like the snow to kind of help to refrigerate that cold air. Less of the snow on the ground means that that air, as it moves farther south in latitude, it starts to modify easier than it would if we had snow on the ground. And you can see North America doing pretty good too, pretty close to average for the past 18 years. And when you factor in both of them for North America as well as the Eurasian continents, we're sitting right there near where we should be for the past 18 years to so slightly above. So that might help us out again initially as we get ready to head into the upcoming winter season. Another thing we really keep an eye on for what's happening at the top of the earth right here, the polar vortex, something that's been talked about a lot here over this past decade. But the polar vortex is not anything that you can see, just a big circulation across the northern part of the globe. There's one also in the southern hemisphere too. But for us up here, sometimes it can get disrupted 
as we head on into a winter season and that could allow some of that cold air to pour farther south. Now in the El Nino year, it usually stays strong and it's keeps a lot of that cold air kind of bottled up. But if it is disrupted or possibly even splits into two, it's able to allow some of that cold air to head farther to the south and systems that are coming by are able to tap into that and bring that cold air even farther south as we head throughout the winter seasons. And something that we keep an eye on for when it comes to that polar vortex and what's happening up across the northern part of the world is the Arctic Oscillation. We look at this index to kind of get an idea of whether that polar vortex is stronger at the time or whether it's going to be weakening. Anytime you see it above the zero line right here, that's when it's, it's fairly strong, especially if it gets higher and higher. And recently, these past couple of weeks, we've been seeing more systems come through. We've been keeping a lot of the colder air farther to the north. Even though we've been seeing more systems, they've been milder ones producing more rain rather than snow. Now it is expected to dip for a little while, but then go back up again as we head on into the end of the month and possibly into the earlier part of December. But you can see right at the tail end of this is starting to come back down again. And once we start to see that come back down again, and especially if it gets near zero or below, we start to see some changes on the way and it doesn't happen automatically. Sometimes it takes two to three weeks, maybe even a month before that really starts to show up downstream for us here across more of the US. So looking at the American models, it kind of sort of hints at that being the case for us, it starts to see those changes in the polar vortex and what's happening there in the Arctic Oscillation. And it is calling for some of that colder air to work its way farther south here across the country, especially for us here in the Pacific Northwest. The greens, the blues, the purples mean cooler than normal temperatures expected as we head into the mid to late December time frame, possibly even into early January. European model also kind of go along with that same sort of solution as we head into that time. Now, you don't only just need the cold air to produce the snow. You need the moisture too to be around and during a typical El Nino year, you sometimes see a lot of that moisture staying farther to the south and that's what the America model is suggesting. Greens and blues that indicates above normal precipitation, seeing a lot of that across the southern tier of the US, especially across the southeast. The European model not as much across California or Arizona, but definitely seeing that here across parts of the southeast again, while us here across the Pacific Northwest browns meaning drier than normal conditions expected at that time. We'll see how that all kind of comes into play. Now, when we take all that into consideration, this is what we're thinking here for the upcoming winter season. This is what we're talking about as far as precipitation. We're thinking that here across this part of the state, especially Western Washington, will be near normal when it comes to our precipitation as opposed to what you might see farther east across the state and heading into Montana, which is expected to be rather dry. And then farther to the south, typical El Nino year, you see a lot more of that moisture staying farther south across California and the southern part of the country. And also something that's really resembles what we usually see during an El Nino year, warmer than normal conditions up here across the Pacific Northwest. And that's something that we're going to see here for the months of December, January, and February when you take all of them into consideration. Now, we talked about this before, right? Even though the conditions favor these solutions, it doesn't automatically guarantee that this is going to be the case. And as a matter of fact, if you can think back to 2019, it was that February here at SeaTac Airport that we had the snowiest uh, February on record over 20 inches of snow. So snow lovers, that's just something to keep in mind, especially if you're a snow lover here in the lowlands that even though we may have all these indicators that might mean warmer than normal conditions and drier than normal conditions, Mother Nature is always going to have the final say.